Good evening. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. I'm Philip Munoz. I'm the director of the uh, Potenziani Program in Constitutional Studies and the director of our uh, Tocqueville program here at Notre Dame. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to welcome you here uh, for an event I've been looking forward to hosting for, for months now. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, one of our student fellows who's going to introduce our speaker. Uh, uh, just a few uh, announcements. Um, for any undergraduates here, uh, I know you're about to register for class. If you're interested in the Constitutional Studies minor, we have some information uh, out on the table there. Come talk to me afterwards. Come talk to Jen Smith, uh, who's floating around uh, in the back there. Uh, she, she helps me run the program. Uh, if you're visiting, um, I know we have a number of visitors. Uh, the best way to find out about our programs is actually our, our Facebook site, uh, constudies uh, uh, at nd.edu. Uh, follow us on Facebook. We put up all of our advertisements, or just go to the, the Con Studies webpage or the Tocqueville webpage. Uh, and that's how you can find out about all of our events. You're always, always welcome. Uh, as I said, I've been looking forward to this event for, for some time since I first uh, read about Mr. Dreer. I knew the book was coming out. Uh, I had a chance to talk to him before the book came out, and I told him, as soon as that book comes out, we're going to uh, we're going to bring you out. Uh, then he told me what the speaking fee was, and I said, well, we have to wait a few, mo <laughs> a few months, and then we'll, <laughs> then we'll bring you out. But we're, we're really happy that you're, that you're here. Uh, w one of my favorite parts of being director of the, of the programs is we have a group of undergraduate fellows. We call them our Tocqueville Fellows, and they help us plan events. Uh, they help us host the events. Tomorrow morning, they're going to have uh, breakfast with Mr. Dreer, uh, and they also introduce our speakers. So it's my pleasure to uh, call to the podium uh, Soren Hansen. Soren's a junior here, uh, Lewis Hall, a PLS major, but really she's a constitutional studies minor. Uh, and Soren will introduce our speaker. Hi, everyone, and welcome. And thank you, Professor Munoz. It is my esteemed pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker. Um, Roger hails from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and he's a graduate of Louisiana State University. He's a writer by trade, and he writes mostly on religion, politics, film, and culture. He's also a blogger at the American Conservative and author of several books, all with uh, particularly great titles. So I'm going to read you a couple of them. The first from 2006 is Crunchy Cons, How Birkenstock Burkeans, Gun-Loving Organic Gardeners, Evangelical Free-Range Farmers, Hip Homeschooling Mamas, Right-Wing Nature Lovers, and their diverse tribe of countercultural conservatives plan to save America, or at least the Republican Party. Another great one. <laughs> Another great title from 2015, and as a PLS major, great books major, I especially like this one, How Dante Can Save Your Life. And the, the book that we are going to be hearing about this evening, The Benedict Option, which was uh, put out in 2017, which is Benedict Option, A Strategy for Christians in a Post-Christian na Nation. Um, an interesting fact about this book is that it has been translated into seven different languages. So... With that short and sweet introduction, please join me in welcoming Roger. Hi. It's, it's great to see such a, uh, a big turnout tonight. Thank you for, for coming. Let me move this up a little. Um, yeah, it, it is fascinating to me, too, that this book is, it has been translated or will soon be translated into seven different languages, which tells me that the, the sense of crisis that I try to address in the book is, um, is something uh, global, or at least within the West, although I have to say that it's going to be published in South Korea, too, so um, who knows where this is, is going to go. It's a pleasure to be at Notre Dame for a couple of reasons. First, I'm going to the football game this weekend. And as, as an LSU fan, as a graduate of LSU, and as somebody who lives in Baton Rouge, it will be a pleasure to go to a football game with a winning team this year. So, something unusual. And it's also, more seriously, to me, it, it's great to be here because if you've read the Benedict Option, you know there are four Notre Dame professors who are key to this book and its thesis. I'm not claiming that they, they, I, I've, they would want to be associated with the book necessarily, but they meant a lot to me. And the first, of course, is Alistair McIntyre, 
then uh, Professor Christian Smith, the sociologist, uh, Patrick Deneen, and uh, the historian Brad Gregory. Um, so I want to thank them and thank this university for, uh, for their scholarship and what they've, what they've contributed to my understanding of, of the time we're in and what uh, we might do about it as Christians. Well, by now, if you've heard anything at all about the Benedict Option, you will have heard that it's alarmist about the condition of the church in the West. And you know what? I'm not going to deny that. I'm going to own that. In fact, let me affirm the accusation. The Benedict Option is alarmist. But that's because there's a lot to be alarmed about. If you are a Christian in the West today who is not alarmed, then you're not paying attention. In fact, I believe that in the West, we are living through the religious and cultural equivalent of the great flood of the Bible. It is a time of catastrophe, yes, but it's a particular kind of catastrophe, one that is obliterating the old order, including and especially uh, Christian faith. The floodwaters are liquid modernity. This is a phrase coined by the sociologist Zygmunt Bauman to describe the constant change that's characteristic of our time. For Bauman, modernity was solid in the sense that a definite and radical change had been set in motion uh, by the Enlightenment, but change happened at a rate that was absorbable. That is, people could get used to the changes such that life itself felt solid comprehensible. But at some point, probably in the 20th century, the rate of change sped up so fast that modernity became liquid. That is, before this or that change took solid form, things changed again. To live in liquid modernity, then, is to experience life as having no fixed landmarks or pathways. You can go wherever your desires take you. Bauman said that the kind of person who thrives in liquid modernity is one who has no fixed commitments that would impede his autonomy. Um, if before we thought of ourselves as in some sense on a grand pilgrimage through life, moving in a definite direction with everyone else, today we experience life more as tourists. Tourists travel with their chosen parties. They go where they want to go. They drop in and out of places long enough to drain them dry of interest and then move on guided by their individual whim with no purpose other than keeping themselves from being bored. Now, please understand that I'm speaking of tourism in this context, mostly uh, in terms of a metaphor. The places that tourists, in the sense I mean, visit are marriages, religions, jobs, communities, and so forth. I myself have been quite the tourist in the course of my life. And I'm not proud of that fact, but that's, that's the modern condition. And it's something that I, one of the reasons I've tried so hard to figure out how to escape this cycle that uh, seems to trap so many of us. Anyway, liquid modernity has brought about the loss of traditions, religious and otherwise. It has fomented the dissolution of bonds among people. It has caused a loss of a shared sense of authority as well as a sense of connection to the past and to the future. And it has terribly compromised the ability of people to reason together and therefore to live together in peace. People have come to see truth these days as what feels true for them. This is, as most of you no doubt know, what Alistair McIntyre calls emotivism. You cannot argue with someone's feelings. And if you can't argue with someone's feelings, then how can you settle disputes? You really can't, except through the raw exercise of power. And I think our politics are strongly tending in that direction. The experience of rapid fragmentation that America is going through did not start with Donald Trump, nor did it start with the 1960s, which is the conservatives like me love to point to the 60s. It's like, uh-huh, that they did it. Well, yeah, they did it, but it didn't start with them. It has been underway for a very long time, but is now reaching critical mass. In fact, uh, McIntyre famously compared our civilization at this point in time to the fall of the Roman Empire in the West. I think he's right about that, and that the most important thing for believing traditional Christians to do is to stop caring so much about shoring up the empire, by which I mean dedicating their primary passions, their primary passions, to reforming and renewing an order that is probably at this point beyond saving. Instead, they, we, should focus primarily, but not exclusively, 
on shoring up communities of faith for the long dark age ahead. McIntyre said, of course, that we await a new and doubtless very different St. Benedict. For me as a Christian, I interpret this as saying that if we want to be faithful to the truth in this chaotic time, we lay people have to look to the example of the early Benedictine monks for inspiration and direction and how to live out our beliefs in community. More on this shortly. The fact is we live in a post-Christian civilization in the sense that our civilization no longer understands itself by the biblical narrative. That would be challenging enough to the Christian church if the church were in good shape. But the church in the West, not the global South, in the West is in terrible shape. And our inability to recognize this and to face the facts squarely without sentimentality only makes it worse. The churches are in a state of rapid decline, both in terms of quantity and quality. By quantity, I mean the number of people who claim to be Christian. As we all know, in Europe, the Christian faith is flat on its back in both Protestant and Catholic countries. I saw the other day that just last year, the Church of England lost 34,000 people, 34,000 in just one year. As a matter of fact, Pope Benedict XVI, who I like to call the second Benedict of the Benedict Option, likened Europe's spiritual crisis to, yes, the fall of the Roman Empire. In the United States, we thought for a long time that we were an exception to this trend, but that's simply no longer the case. The bottom has fallen out with the millennial generation. A couple of years ago, two of the leading sociologists of religion surveying the most recent social science data concluded that the United States has at long last joined Europe on the steep downward slide to unbelief. Now by quality, I'm talking about the nature of Christian belief and the fidelity to Christian orthodoxy as it has been broadly understood for centuries. As many of you who follow my blog know, I draw the bulk of my diagnosis from the research of Notre Dame sociologist Christian Smith. He and his colleagues over the years have found overwhelmingly that the de facto religion of American young people is what he calls moralistic therapeutic deism. It's a shallow, feel-good form of Christianity that has very little to do with, the, with historical biblical faith. MTD tells us that God exists and he wants us to be nice and happy. We don't have to consult him unless we need something. Good people go to heaven and except for Hitler, we're pretty much all good. <laughs> Smith and his team have found that the majority of young Christian adults deny that their moral beliefs are grounded in the Bible or traditional church authority. For them, truth is what feels right to them as autonomous choosing individuals. A faith that is not grounded in anything other than emotivism cannot survive, and it won't survive. And note well, we older Christians absolutely cannot blame young people for what they believe and don't believe. As Christian Smith points out, these young people were formed intellectually, morally, and spiritually by moralistic therapeutic deists. I'm 50 years old. I was raised in the 1970s. When I first read about MTD around 2005, the year I believe that Professor Smith first defined the concept, I recognized that bland, inoffensive, let's just be nice, cultural Christianity in which I had been raised was in fact moralistic therapeutic deism. Again, it has been with us for a very long time. Now when I traveled to Christian colleges, both evangelical and Catholic around this country, I always make a point to talk to professors and campus ministers as well as students about what, camp, what life is like on campus. I hear the same thing without fail no matter where I go, that young people are coming to college straight out of, uh, of high school, Christian high schools, including Christian high schools and church youth groups, knowing almost nothing substantive about the Christian faith. Worse, they don't even know how little they know, or they don't know what they don't know, and they don't know why it matters. MTD, then, is the last stop before apostasy. I would say to you young Christians in the audience tonight, your elders may have done a terrible job in catechizing you and forming you, but now that you are adults, you have a very serious responsibility to make up for it. If you don't, you're probably going to lose your faith. You really will. The pressures from the post-Christian culture are just too strong. 
a little side anecdote. I remember back in, um, right about the year 2000, I was, I was living in Brooklyn then and working for the New York Post, and I was a Catholic in those days, a pretty militant conservative Catholic, and I loved to sit around with my fellow conservative Catholic friends and complain endlessly about what the church was not doing. Complain about the bishops, complain about the sermons and the church, and on and on and on. One night we were having dinner in my apartment, having this usual conversation, and one of our, the people at our table was a Catholic priest from the uh, Diocese of Brooklyn. And he said, you know what, guys? He is, a, is about our age, is our age. He said, you know what, guys? Everything you say is right. I was raised in the 70s, too. Uh, and it was, if you can believe it, it was even worse back then. He said, but my parents knew what they were up against and what we kids were up against. And they took it upon themselves to catechize us. And uh, it was so much more difficult for them back then to do it than it is for you with your children today. He said, you can go online on Amazon.com tonight and have sent to your house within a week a library that Thomas Aquinas could, could hardly have dreamed of. He said, all it takes is the will to do it. You've got the catechism. You've got the tools. You've just got to do it. Stop sitting around waiting for somebody to come save you. Well, I remember we looked at him and said, wow, wow. And then we went right back to complaining about the bishops endlessly. <laughs> um, anyway, moralistic therapeutic deism is the perfect faith for liquid modernity. According to Zygmunt Bauman, the kind of person who will thrive in liquid modernity, as I said earlier, is one who has no fixed commitments or no fixed beliefs or commitments beyond desire. I believe that in general, in this culture, the process of dissolution is too far gone to stop. It has too much momentum. As a result, Christians are facing and will continue to face these two social facts, summarized like this by the Christian writer Andy Crouch. One, Social hostility and legal restrictions will undermine the viability of many Christian institutions and significantly limit individual Christians' participation in many professions and aspects of public life in the United States within a generation or so. Two, due to a lack of meaningful discipleship and accommodation to various features of secularized modernity and consumer culture, the collapse of Christian belief and practice is likely among members of the dominant culture and many minority cultures in the United States within a generation or so. Those Christians who go with the flow of liquid modernity and who live like Bauman's ideal liquid modernist are gonna be washed downstream and over the falls. I wrote the Benedict Option to address these two basic social facts and to try to find another way a way out of this fate. So it's here that we turn for rescue to the rule of St. Benedict, written by the monastic founder in the early 6th century. In the prologue of the rule, Benedict calls the 6th century monastic version of Bauman's liquid modernist a gyrovag, which he denounces as absolutely the worst kind of monk. The gyrovag flits from monastery to monastery with no sense of stability or commitment. Therefore, he cannot hope to grow spiritually or otherwise. I think this is clearly true for us 21st century Christians as well. To be a gyrovag now is to be completely in sync with our time, but it is also to accept the death of Christianity as a living faith within your own heart and your own life, whether you know it or not. St. Benedict's rule and the monastic communities that grew out of it offer the the antidote to gyrovagary, if I can use that word. They did it back then, and they still do. And I believe that Benedict has the secret for the church's survival in this new dark age. Let me explain why. And before I do that, I want to say simply that before I read the rule of St. Benedict, I always imagined that it would be some very thin rule book of mystical teachings of the Desert Fathers, that sort of thing. When I actually picked it up and read it, I thought, this is so boring. There's, it's just a manual for how to live daily life in a monastery. But uh, that's really deceiving. It's actually an amazing book that talks about the day in and day out meat and potatoes practices that you have to do in order to live out the faith in community. Again, none of us are called to be monks, so I wouldn't say that we need to take it literally, but the, the secret of the rule of St. Benedict is its everydayness. And that's what I think makes it so, one of the things that makes it so attractive and possible for us to, to adapt. 
Anyway, the collapse of the Roman Empire in the West did not happen overnight, but it was a terrible shock all the same when it came. Benedict was born in the year 480, four years after the pathetic abdication of the final Caesar. When he came of age, Benedict's Christian parents sent him down from their Italian mountain village of Nursia to complete his education in the city of Rome. Young Benedict was so disgusted by the chaos and the decadence he found in the Eternal City that he abandoned his studies and retreated to a cave in Subiaco. There he fasted and he prayed and he sought God's will. When he emerged, he went on to found the religious order that today bears his name. He wrote his rule, and when he died, he left behind 12 or 13, I can't remember the exact number, of monasteries in the vicinity of Rome. Now, Benedict did not try to save Roman civilization. He did not try to make Rome great again. All he wanted to do was to put God first in his life in a radical way and to serve God in community. When Benedict died in the year 547, he could not possibly have foreseen what God was going to do with that little mustard seed of faith that he planted. Over the next few centuries, Benedictine monasticism spread like wildfire across Dark Ages Europe. Slowly, almost imperceptibly, the monks built monasteries that served as sanctuaries of light, of peace, of stability, and learning. Simply by being faithful to and disciplined in their calling and sharing the fruits of their prayer and their work with those outside the monastery, the Benedictine monks laid the groundwork for the rebirth of civilization. Almost two years ago, I spent a week at the Benedictine monastery in Norcia, which is what St. Benedict's hometown is called today, uh, praying with the monks who, are, who live there now, eating with them, and spending time in long interviews with them about their way of life. From those conversations and from studying the rule, I discerned a number of ways we Christians who live in the world, Catholic, Protestant, and Eastern Orthodox, can adapt monastic insights to our way of life out here. These involve a mixture of prayer, of contemplation, of scripture study, of ascetic practices like fasting, of work, and of building local community. I don't have time tonight to discuss them in depth, it's all in the book, but I will say that the ultimate goal of all these practices is to bring us closer individually and in community to a transformative union with God. The Benedict option is not the gospel, nor is it a Pelagian strategy for earning merit. We can do nothing without the freely given grace of God, but there are things we can do to keep the, the ground of our own spirits tilled to be receptive to God's grace. Uh, there are things we can do to practice the presence of God. For the Benedictine monks, religion is not part of life, it is a way of life. It has to be the same thing for us. The Benedict option then is a way of structuring our lives to keep God always before us. It's a kind of spiritual training through which our hearts and minds will be formed by the Holy Spirit. I wrote the Benedict Option for all small o Orthodox Christians. Well, what do I mean by small o Orthodox Christians? I mean all Christians, again, Catholics, Protestants, and Eastern Orthodox, who believe that there is an unseen order surrounding and embracing us, that that order is revealed to us in the person of Jesus Christ, but also through scripture, through the church, the church of the centuries, the church of tradition, and indeed, in some mysterious sense, through all things. Christians are intended by God to conform our lives to this order. In his new book, God is Not Nice, the uh, Catholic theologian Ulrich Lehner, who teaches at Marquette, says that the major decision in everyone's life is whether or not we approach the world as if there is an inherent objective order that we can know and relate to, or that the world outside ourselves is meaningless except for the meaning we project onto it. That's the big decision we have to make. Well, small o orthodox Christians, that is to say Christians who still find themselves rooted in the great tradition of the first thousand years of Christianity, and, uh, and I, by that includes some Reformation Christians too, um, who draw heavily on St. Augustine. Uh, we believe that truth is objective and that religious faith is uh, a way by which we order our own lives 
to know that truth and to live in that truth more and more, uh, the, a truth which is complete in Christ Jesus. By contrast, modernist Christians believe that religious truth can more or less be changed to suit our felt needs in a particular time or place. That kind of Christianity, I believe, is a house built on shifting sand, and it will simply not survive this time of testing. The Reformed theologian Hans Borsma, he's the guy I get the, the, the phrase the great tradition from, Borsma says our modern condition makes it hard to perceive the unseen order. We're not just called to trust in Christ for eternal salvation, but we are called to participate in God's existence and do that in part by recognizing him everywhere present and filling all things. The world itself, creation, is not dead matter, but a sacrament. It's a sign through which, and signs through which God mysteriously reveals himself to us. This was, generally speaking, the patristic view and the view that was universal in Christendom until around the 14th century. One of the monks of Norches said to me that we Christians, all of us, have to order our lives so that we become icons through which the light of God, the radiance of God, can shine. Now, one of the particular Benedictine virtues worth mentioning here is stability. Each monk of the Benedictine order, when he makes his final profession, vows to stay in that monastery until the day he dies, barring some unforeseen circumstance. This is called the vow of stability. It made an enormous difference in the world of the early Benedictines. As I've said, this was a time of massive civilization-wide chaos. The Benedictine vow of stability made individual monks and their monasteries, their monastic communities, still points in a fast-hurting world. Professor Russell Hittinger, who is a Benedictine oblate, told me that the vow of stability was central to the Benedictine order's civilization-transforming work in the early Middle Ages. For example, when the monks would go out into a rural area and build a monastery, say a, a, a band of barbarians would come in and slaughter all the monks and sack the monastery. Well, the mother house would just send more monks. Eventually, the peasants came to understand that these monks, these men of God, were not going to abandon them. So the peasants would settle near the monasteries because they knew them as a place of order, stability, peace, and love. If we adapt some form of stability in our own lives, living in the 21st century world, we will not only uh, show a, or give a powerfully countercultural witness, but I believe we really will in the communities we establish, whether it's in our parishes, our schools, what have you, that we will draw refugees from this world of chaos and pain to our communities and through us to Jesus Christ. But the point cannot be made strongly enough. St. Benedict did not set out to save civilization. Rather, he only wanted to serve God with all his heart, soul, and mind and do it in community. Everything else followed from that. So anybody today who characterizes the Benedict option as a plan to take America back for Christ or any such thing should set that notion aside this is about protecting and saving and continuing the work of the church, which is the work of Christ in history. Think of it like this. In the culture war, the church has lost decisively. We have been isolated on Dunkirk Beach, so to speak. So we have three choices. We can launch a frontal attack on the enemy and be annihilated. We can sit still and mind our own business and hope that the enemy leaves us alone and be annihilated. Or we can climb aboard that little flotilla awaiting us in the channel and cross over to England. There within relative, underscore relative safety, we can spiritually regroup and retrain and prepare to rejoin the battle when the opportunity presents itself. When the British Army retreated from Dunkirk, it was not to leave the war. That wasn't even a possibility, but rather it was to rebuild their ranks for the long struggle ahead. That's how it has to be with us. I should add, too, uh, that I, I talked to Professor Michael Hanby at the John Paul II Institute in Washington before I started the book project. He's a friend and has been an inspiration for this project. And I asked him for some words of advice for proceeding. He said, I would tell you 
to ask yourself at every turn, what would Wojtyla do? Like, wait, what do you mean? He said, I'm not talking about Pope John Paul II, I'm talking about before he became Pope, before he became the Cardinal Archbishop, when he was just Carol Wojtyla and um, studying in the seminary. I'm talking about World War II, he said, because when the Nazis occupied Poland, they didn't just intend to administer Poland, they intended to uh, obliterate Polish national culture and the Catholic Church, the Catholic faith in the hearts of Poles. Uh, Karol Wojtyla and his circle knew that there was no point in taking on the Nazis directly, but they also knew that their form of resistance had to be keeping cultural memory alive in that dark night of Nazi occupation. So one thing they would do would be to write plays um, on Catholic themes or Polish patriotic themes and perform those plays underground in underground theaters. If the Gestapo came, knew about this, they could come in, arrest them all, have them all killed. They were risking their lives to perform plays. But cultural memory, keeping cultural memory alive was a powerful form of resistance. Professor Hanby said it has to be that way with us too. Even though we're, not, we're not, obviously not facing Nazi tyranny, nevertheless, we're facing the dictatorship of relativism, as Pope Benedict said, and a time of forgetting. That's what modernity is, a time of forgetting. Anyway, it should be clear now that this is not what I'm talking about. It's not a head for the hill strategy. We have to stay involved with the world to some extent if we are going to be faithful to the Great Commission. But if we are going to represent Jesus Christ faithfully to the post-Christian world, we have no choice but to spend significantly more time away from that world in prayer, in worship, in contemplation, in thickening our communal ties for the sake of building spiritual resilience. In other words, we have to spend more time away from the world so that we can go into the world as faithful Christians. Let me use another analogy. Uh, a lot of people under, uh, know about Jeremiah 29, what uh, God said to the Hebrew exiles in Babylon through the prophet Jeremiah. He told them that he brought them there to exile for his own reasoning, for his own reason. But uh, he, adv he told them to settle there in the city, establish families, pray for the peace and prosperity of the city. Um, and a lot of people know about that, um, and they see that, I think, correctly as our calling in this world, in, in this post-Christian world, as exiles here. But also, we have to keep in mind Daniel 3, the story of the three Hebrew men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's a story that's not told as often. Um, they were uh, servants of the king, high officials of the king, but they were also Hebrews, when King Nebuchadnezzar built a golden idol and ordered everybody to bow down and worship it, they refused. Uh, and they refused to the point of being willing to die in a fiery furnace. God worked a miracle and they weren't consumed by the flames. But um, the point is, they were ready to die before apostatizing, even though they were deeply embedded in the state and in the culture of Babylon. We have to live out Jeremiah 29, but do it in such a way that whatever it was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did, the way they lived in their religious communities, to always keep before us and to form ourselves so that we will not apostatize when we're put to the test. It may not be a test where our lives are at stake, but we will be put to the test. Now, a couple of weeks ago, here on the Notre Dame campus, the Jesuit father Antonio Spadaro, very close advisor to Pope Francis, denounced the Benedict Option as a, quote, Masada complex. If you don't know, Masada was the mountain stronghold in which Jewish rebels hid out from a Roman siege and all committed suicide rather than surrender to Caesar's troops. Father Spadaro, in other words, was saying that this is a fortress Christianity, a hysterical fortress Christianity. He condemned alarmists like me who, in his view, are spreading worries that, quote, have no basis in reality. The Benedict Option, he went on to say, is contrary to Pope Francis's vision of engagement with the world. The church is not a fortress, he said, but rather in Francis's phase, phrase, a field hospital. Well, allow me to offer a fraternal correction to the good father. Yes, it is true that the church is a field hospital, 
but what kind of doctors and nurses and medics are going to staff that field hospital? We Christians today are not ready to do so. We cannot share with the world what we do not have. In our present state, it would be like going out into a field hospital in the middle of a war with no medical training at all, just good wishes, uh, and armed with nothing but a sack full of oxycodone pills to take away the pain of the people suffering without any real healing. A Russian Orthodox priest friend of mine also says the church is a field hospital. But he, he says lots of people come to the church complaining of pain, but they only want a pill to make the hurting stop. What they really need is surgery and deep therapy for the sake of true healing. Sometimes it's got to hurt for a while in order to get truly better. This is real, authentic spiritual medicine. And I know it works because this priest was my own priest, and he used it on me when I was deeply broken from uh, problems I was having with my father and reconciling myself to my father. My priest would not let me rest on anger. And um, he, even though I wanted him to soothe me in my own anger at my dad, he's like, yeah, your dad treated you badly, but you cannot rest in anger. Christ will not allow it. You're not being faithful. And because I took that hard medicine, um, I was around for, to hear my father say to me before he died the words I'd waited all my adult life to hear, that he was sorry. And I was able to spend the last eight days of my dad's life in home hospice care with him, living in, living in his bedroom with him, reading the Psalms to him, reading stories to him, praying with him, rubbing lotion into his dry feet, and holding his hand when he breathed his last. Um, I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that if I had not taken that hard, painful medicine of denying myself to take up my cross and to learn to love my father, even though he didn't love me as I wanted him to, I would not have been there for that enormous blessing of, be, of being able to hold his hand when he died and to die with peace between us, a peace that had not been there for most of my life. So it's real. It's serious. We need this real healing, this painful medicine. I want to share some insights with you, some facts to counter Father Spadaro's candide Catholicism. These come from the work, again, of Notre Dame sociologist Christian Smith and his teams of uh, sociologists over the years. I can't recommend to you strongly enough his work. In 2011, he published a book called Lost in Transition, The Dark Side of Emerging Adulthood. It's about the moral lives of 18 to 23-year-olds. It makes for very depressing reading, but again, it's truthful reading. It's stuff we have to face and deal with. Among his findings, 60% of this group say that morality is entirely a personal choice. They make no appeal to religion, tradition, or philosophy as an external guide to inform that choice. Most of these people, Professor Smith said, are not strict moral relativists but they can't explain or justify their beliefs, and they certainly don't want to impose those beliefs on others. An astonishing 61% of the emerging adults, again, 18 to 23-year-olds, have no moral problem at all with materialism and consumerism. An added 30% expressed some qualms but figured it was not worrying, worth worrying about. In this view, say Smith and his team, quote, all that society is, apparently, is a collection of autonomous individuals out to enjoy life. This is not their fault, necessarily. These young people, as I said earlier, were failed by parents, churches, schools, and other institutions that offered them nothing but feel-good platitudes. Adults like to tell themselves that the kids are okay, that they're nice, hardworking, committed to social justice, and so forth, but, says Professor Smith, it's simply not true. The data do not bear that out. Well, we older Americans are just as bad as them. It's not that we have something good and useful to teach the young, but we're just failing to communicate it. In too many cases, we are just as lost as they are. Now, this is all Americans, but things are as bad or even worse with Catholics in particular. Sorry, Father Spadaro. In 2014, Christian Smith and his team published a book focusing exclusively on young people in the U.S. Catholic Church. It's extremely grim reading, I hate to tell you, but it, again, it's stuff we need to know if we're going to treat the actual problem. For most young Catholics, the faith, the Catholic faith does not set them apart in any way from the secular world. They have been almost entirely assimilated. 
Most do not accept the church and the magisterium as their authoritative teacher and don't consider the church to be particularly necessary for their spiritual lives at all. Young people raised in liberal Catholic homes are abandoning the faith in massive numbers. It looks better, significantly better, for those raised in traditionally Catholic homes, but the picture is still pretty shaky. When Catholics look and think like the rest of the world, what does Father Spadaro think they have to share with the world? Well, I wrote the Benedict Option for Catholics and other Christians who prefer to see the world as it really is and not through the gauzy haze of fail, the failed sentimentality of 1970s Catholicism. Contrary to Father Spadaro's diagnosis, the problem is not that Catholics aren't going out enough into the world. The problem is that the world is too much in Catholics. Catholic leaders who are trying to turn the church into a Romanized version of mainline Protestantism are not helping to turn the tide of liquid modernity or to help the faithful understand what's going on and to hold on to their faith in spite of it, but rather they're channeling liquid modernity right into the heart of the church. These people are not the future. The future of the church, in fact, is in the distant past. There has never been a golden age of Christianity, uh, heaven knows, but our fathers and mothers in the faith had resources that we do not. We can find them again. In the Benedict Option, I write about this community, this magnificent community of lay Catholics in Italy uh, who call themselves the Tipiloski, which means the usual suspects. It gives you an idea of, of how seriously they take themselves. But they are, they are serious about their faith. They're deeply orthodox, but they're not angry about it. In fact, the um, the leader of the group is the head of Italy's Chesterton Society. So that gives you an idea of how jolly they are in their Catholicism. Uh, Marco Sermarini is his name, and he's probably the greatest man I know, and I'm not, not kidding one bit. He told me when I interviewed him, this is in the book, you know, I asked him, how is it that you do this? You and your, and your, your community here has done this. You have, you're teaching the faith to your children. They're excited about it. It's just a thick community that does works of mercy and charity out in the community. But you also have Bible study here. You have feast here. You have community gardening. You have it all. And uh, you have a close relationship with the monks of Norcia who come down here all the time. Your kids go to confession and they actually like it. How did you do this? He said, Rod, we didn't invent anything new. We just rediscovered what was there all along, but we had forgotten about Father Cassian Folsom, the, the man who refounded the monastery in Norcia, which had been closed for almost 200 years, he refounded it in, uh, around the turn of the century. He was the prior of the monastery, uh, for the first prior for a long time, and he told me that Christians who don't do something like the Benedict Option communities, they're not going to make it through what's to come, the trials to come. I think that he's right about that, obviously, or I wouldn't have written the book. <clears throat> but I also think that we need to look to those, that particular group of monks, the Benedictine monks in Norcia, um, as a sign to the world. They have become a sign in ways I didn't anticipate when I began writing the Benedict Option. In August of 2016, a few months after I had been there, a devastating earthquake shook that region around Norcia. When the quake hit in the middle of the night, the monks were awake to pray matins, and they ran to the mon from the monastery out into the piazza there for safety. Father Cassian later reflected that the, the earthquake symbolized the crumbling of the West Christian culture, but that there was a second hopeful symbol that night. The second symbol, he said, is the gathering of the people around the statue of St. Benedict in the piazza in order to pray. That is the only way to rebuild, he wrote to supporters. Well, the tremors left that Basilica Church too structurally unstable for worship, and it left most of their monastery, which is right there in the middle of town, uninhabitable. They saw the cracks in the wall and said, it's not safe to be here. So they evacuated the town and moved to their land on the, in the next, next door mountainside, just outside the Norcia walls. They pitched tents in the ruins of an older monastery and they continued their prayer life, interrupted only by visits to the town to minister to the people. The monks received distinguished visitors in their exile, including the Prime Minister of Italy and Cardinal Robert Serra, 
who heads the Vatican's liturgical office. Cardinal Sarah blessed the monks' temporary quarters, celebrated mass with them, and told them that their tent monastery, quote, reminds me of Bethlehem, where it all began. I am certain, said Cardinal Sarah, that the future of the church is in the monasteries, because where prayer is, there is the future. Five days later, more earthquakes shook Norcia. The cross atop the basilica's facade toppled to the ground. And then, early on the morning of Sunday, October 30th, 2016, the strongest earthquake to hit Italy in 30 years struck, with its epicenter just north of the town. The 14th century Basilica of St. Benedict, the patron saint of Europe, fell violently to the ground. Only its facade remained. Not a single church in Norcia, not a single church remained standing. With dust still rising from the rubble, Father Basil, one of the monks there, knelt on the stones of the piazza facing the ruined basilica and accompanied by nuns and a few elderly people from town, including one in a wheelchair. I saw this on YouTube. Uh, he prayed. It was an amazing witness. Later, you could see amateur video posted to YouTube showing Father Basil, Father Benedict, and Father Martin, three of the monks there, running through the streets of the town with dust still in the air from the earthquake, looking for the dying who needed last rites. By the grace of God, nobody had died there, but it was what an amazing witness. These monks, rather than taking care of themselves, they ran into the town to look for people to minister to, to pray with, and to comfort in their last days, and their last, what they thought would be their last moments. Those monks ran toward danger. If this is not withdrawing from the world. Back in America, Father Richard Chipola, a Catholic priest in Connecticut, who's an old friend of Father Benedict's, emailed uh, Father Benedict Nivikov, the sub-prior of the monastery, when he heard the news of the latest quake. Is there damage? What's going on? Father Chipola wrote. Yes, damage, much worse, Father Benedict replied. But we're okay, much to tell you, but just pray. I am well, and God continues to purify us and bring very good things. Think about that. They've just seen everything they own destroyed, and yet he gives thanks to God for pur the purification. The next morning, as the sun rose over Norcia, Father Benedict, the sub-prior, sent a message to the monastery's friends all over the world. I'm on their email list, too. He said that no Norcini, no people of Norcia, had lost their lives in the quake because they had heeded the warnings from the earlier tremors and left town. In other words, they read the signs of the times and got out of town. Quote, God spent two months preparing us for the complete destruction of our patron's church so that when it finally happened, we would watch it in horror but in safety from atop the town he wrote. Father Benedict added, these are mysteries which will take years, not days or months, to understand. Surely that's true, but notice this. The earth moved and the Basilica of St. Benedict, which had stood firm for many centuries, tumbled to the ground. Only the facade, the mere semblance of a church, remains. Because the monks headed for the hills after the August earthquake, they survived. God preserved them in the holy poverty of their canvas-covered Bethlehem, where they continued to live out the rule in the ancient way by chanting the old mass. Now they can begin rebuilding and have begun to rebuild in the ruins. Their resilient Benedictine faith taking them to receive this catastrophe as a call to deeper holiness and sacrifice. God willing, new life will one day arise again from the rubble. Father Benedict wrote, we pray and watch from the mountainside, thinking of the long three years St. Benedict spent in the cave before God decided to call him out to become a light to the world. Fiat, fiat, let it be, let it be. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches, to you, to me, to all of us. God is speaking to us, I believe, through the monks of Norcia and their example and the example of faithful Christians all over the West who can read the signs of the times and are preparing. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions.
like to say, by the way, please don't hesitate to ask critical questions. I don't want to present myself as somebody who has all the answers. I say in the book um, that uh, we're going to have to work this out together as Christians in community, talking with each other, uh, because we haven't faced a situation quite like this um, uh, ever. I mean, the only thing I can think about is the fall of the Roman Empire, but you know, that's forever ago. We not, have no lived experience of this. So um, if I get something wrong, I want to know about it because I've got skin in this game. I've got children. I want my children to grow up in the faith, and I want the people in my parish to be able to hold on to the faith and raise their children in the faith. So if you've got a good idea, let's hear it. Okay, we want to hear as many ideas as possible. Uh, and that means you, everyone needs to be uh, uh, efficient in their questions, and our speaker has to be efficient in his answers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, well, you know, I write such, such crisp blogs yeah. that are uh, short, sweet. Um, we have a tradition here at the program, which is we always ask our undergraduate students to ask the first set of questions. And so uh, I see a bunch of undergraduates. Also, please stand up. It's a large room. Stand up and uh, tell us who you are and your, where you are at Notre Dame or in the community. Hi, my name is Claire. I'm a junior. I'm a double biology and philosophy major. Is, is that all I need? Okay. Um, I have two questions. I will try to be very brief. Uh, the first is that you've talked a lot about your, your conversion from Protestantism to Catholicism and then later to Russian Orthodoxy. And in your description of converting from Catholicism to Russian Orthodoxy, it seemed like it was more of a reaction and a converting away from the Catholic Church rather than a converting to. And I was wondering how, like aside from the emotional part, how you um, dealt with the change of doctrine, like the, um, the filioque and things like that, like the actual parts of the liturgy which changed rather than just the people. And then the second question was, um, I know that the philosophy section in your book, the chapter, was sort of cut a bit short. You said that you had to pare it down. Um, and I was wondering why you thought that um, Occam was so important. And was he more important in developing liquid modernity than Kant or not? <laughs> to you. It doesn't have to be like a PhD thesis. I just want to know, opinion-wise. Questions <laughs> for the recording. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I, the first question is probably more important to answer. And the question is, I, I was raised Protestant, converted to Catholicism in my 20s, was a Catholic for many years, but I converted to Russian Orthodoxy in 2006. And how do I deal with the change of doctrine? Uh, I'll, I'll be brief, but this is an important Benedict option point. Um, I converted, I, I met Christ seriously as an adult, as a Roman Catholic. And I was, back in 1993, I came into the church. As I was coming into the church, um, I was, a woman in my office said, oh, I hear you're becoming a Catholic. Why don't you come work with me at Mother Teresa's uh, soup kitchen, the Missionaries of Charity Soup Kitchen, this weekend? And I thought, what a great Catholic thing to do. I think I will. And uh, I, I spent the Saturday afternoon scrubbing pots, peeling potatoes and all that. And after it was done, I said, you know, that was nice, but really I'm more of an intellectual. My time would be better spent reading books of theology, and that would be that. Uh, I never went back. So, but I came into the church, and I, I was working in Washington by then, and became really pretty militant in my conservative Catholicism, very political. Um, time marches on. I moved to New York City. I'm working at the New York Post as a columnist, and I start writing about the abuse scandal. Uh, a priest, Father Tom Doyle, told me when I interviewed him, he said, hey, you know, I can tell you're serious about your faith. Um, I just want to warn you that if you continue down this path of investigation, you're going to go to places darker than you can imagine. And I said, well, I feel like I have to do it anyway as a matter of justice, and I'm a Catholic, and I'm a journalist, and I'm a father, and blah, blah, blah. He said, oh, I want you to do it, but I just want you to also be aware of what you're going to face. Well, I wasn't aware of what I was going to face. I, I thought that as long as I had the argument straight in my head, my faith would be safe. It was, I was not prepared for the drip, drip, drip of three years of this caustic acid from the things I was learning and reporting in the scandal, things I couldn't even write about because nobody would go on the record, but I knew they were true. And it was like having my fingernails pulled out. It was the most painful experience of my life. I finally got to the point, my wife and I did, where we lost our ability to believe as Catholics. I, I couldn't imagine this would happen, but it did happen. And um, as Catholics, we figured the only place we had to go was to the Orthodox Church because they had real sacraments. We didn't intend to convert we just wanted to go worship in the real presence without having this constant anger and, and anxiety and fear. And eventually we never went back. Doctrinally, I, I would say that I, the thing that I, I never did settle in my mind 
for good, whether the Orthodox have the best argument for authority or the Catholics do. But I also realized that this was one of the reasons why I got myself in so much trouble as a Catholic. I thought back to the time when I never went back to the soup kitchen. I thought that I was becoming a good Catholic and building myself up in the faith by studying and, and through intellect alone. I needed more balance. I should have in, in, instituted practices in my life. If I had done that over the years, instead of spending all my time just talking about, about the ideas, I, I probably would have had a more resilient faith. I don't know that. I thank God for my Orthodox faith. God saved me from a complete spiritual shipwreck in Orthodoxy. But I, I came to realize that the truth that we worship that saves us is a man, Jesus Christ. And if for whatever reason I could not relate to him in any way through the Catholic Church anymore, then I was going to go to orthodoxy because I needed him above all things. But I was a very different kind of orthodox Christian than I was a Roman Catholic. I, I hope to God that I haven't been as prideful and triumphalist. I was very triumphalist as a Catholic. That's not the Catholic Church's fault. That's my fault. I don't want to be that kind of Orthodox Christian again. So I, I don't get involved in doctrinal arguments anymore. I just try to say my prayers, say the Jesus prayer, and um, build my own faith and family and parish up because getting involved in church politics was a ruin for me. That doesn't answer the doctrinal question, but I, I, it's more important to me that I live out the truth of Christ than I settle that for good within my own mind. Okay, Claire, we're going to let you and... Uh, and Rod hammer out Occam Occam uh, during the book signing. That's yeah, that's okay. That's Jack, that's Jack, Jack Ferguson. Okay, same question. Other undergraduates, please stand up. Tell us. Tell us. Okay, the rule of St. Benedict, um, the questioner says, oh, it works with celibate people, but how can I ask non-celibate people to live it out? Well, the, the answer is, I'm not saying we have to live it out word for word. That would be impossible to do. The rule of St. Benedict is written for people living in monastic community, vowed men or women living in monastic community. What I, I say in the book, though, is we look at examples, at the example of their lives, and find ways to adapt it into our lives. For example, the regular prayer, fasting. I mean, there's no reason why we can't do that in our lives, adapt it to life in the real world, fasting, uh, sanctifying our work. This is not anything hugely special, by the way. I mean, Leah Labresco, who's in my book, um, she's just such a wonderful Catholic. She says, quoted in the book, goes, you're only asking the church to be the church, but if you say it, if you don't give it a special name, people aren't gonna do it. I'm like, you got it exactly right. <laughs> You know, I just want the church to be authentically and uh, uh, committed to being the church, but that also involves practices. Uh, the reason I brought up the, the, the fact that I think my failure to have adopted practices like regular prayer, fasting, things like that as a Catholic left me especially vulnerable when I, was, when I met a time of testing uh, in, a ways, in ways that it did not leave other Catholic friends of mine who were just as upset as I was about the scandal, they weren't vulnerable. 
Um, I'm determined not to let that happen again. And I would say to you too, um, very briefly, when I, was, when I was researching the book, I ran across a, a volume called How Societies Remember by a, an anthropologist, cultural, anthropo cultural anthropologist named Paul Connerton, who's not a Christian. Uh, he writes about soci traditional societies that manage somehow to hold on to their faith in, um, in modernity or hold on to their, their traditional ways in modernity. He said they had several factors in common. First, they had a sacred story. Second, they told the sacred story in ritual, communal ritual. Third, the communal ritual in some sense was understood as taking them out of time and connecting them to the transcendent. And fourth, they worshiped, or they celebrated the ritual in some sense in their bodies. And you read this, and this is an anthropologist writing about all kinds of communities, and you're like, this is Catholicism, this is orthodoxy. You know, we have what it takes right here. We just have to embrace it and embrace it in community and stay with it, not just embrace it notionally, but stay with it. We have a group of students from Hope College that they drove all the way down from Hope, so I want to invite them to, if any of the Hope kids have a question, any more undergraduate questions? And we'll, okay, uh, John. Hi, this is Jack Dell, I'm a senior here at the University of Notre Dame, a political science major, constitutional studies minor. Um, but you sort of alluded to this. My question is, um, it seems that there's been two critiques of your position. One is that you're too alarmist, which I, I agree with your position. I think there's a little alarm. The second critique is, is your argument doesn't, it's not political enough, and that it doesn't, there's, there's no, it's almost like there's no way to motivate people or mobilize people to fight for them. Um, I would focus on the theological aspect uh, that, you know, as Christians, or we're called to, we're called to make one. The salvation of souls is at stake for, you know, Christians of all sorts. Um, so if we're retreating, how do we still keep that in mind? Um, that might be, uh, retreat might be the wrong way to categorize your, your argument, but if we're, we're concerned with the salvation of souls, what's going to happen to those people when we're not going out to the margins, when we're retreating, when we're trying to preserve our culture? Um, what about those people that will not hear the message of Christ? Okay, the, the question is, if we're retreating, what, do we, what about the people who are on the margins who won't hear the message of Christ because we're retreating? And the answer is, there's a reason I call it the strategic retreat. It's because we're not running for the hills. We are retreating, so to speak, into deeper contemplation, deeper prayer. Uh, deeper uh, communal fasting. So when we go out into the world, as we must, we will do so as faithful Christians. We will be able to represent Christ uh, uh, authentically. Um, I simply don't think that in, a, in our culture, as hostile as it is today to, to Christian faith and values, that we will be able to hold the line if we don't do much greater training, so to speak. Asceticism comes from the, the word eschesis, which means training. If we think about, um, about spiritual training like athletes do, you know, if we were asked to run a long race, an endurance race, uh, you would have to do training for that. Well, spiritually and morally, this is the world we're in now. This is not about earning merit. It's about knowing who we are, going deep into scripture, taking a deep dive, and a deep dive into tradition. Uh, I teach my own kids, for example, about the, we read Lives of the Saints, and I especially talk to them about 20th century Christians who are, and 21st century Christians who are suffering right now for the faith or within living memory for the faith, because I want my kids to know that it's possible, that we live in a very comfortable society now, but things could change very quickly, and we can only make the right decisions as these, these martyrs and these confessors did if we're put to the test. If when we're put to the test, if we make those small decisions day in and day out now of spiritual training. Um, but I absolutely believe that we have to evangelize. And by the way, with the Hope College kids here, I should say, this is what I think, how I think evangelicals have a special gift they can give to the whole church right now uh, by your zeal for evangelization. 
Um, I'm not quite sure how evangelicals are going to make it through the uh, Benedict option without the strong liturgical um, sense that Orthodox and Catholics do, but I believe that you're going to have to figure it out. You can figure it out. I was asked by Al Mohler, a uh, leading Southern Baptist, evangel uh, Southern Baptist theologian, um, he asked me in his radio show, do, do evangelicals have what it takes to do the Benedict option? I said, you know, honestly, I don't know. I don't know a whole lot about the evangelical world, but you better have what it takes. And he looked at me and said, no, I can tell you, we don't have what it takes now, but if we will go back to the fundamentals of the Reformation, that's where we evangelicals will find the resources to do the Benedict option. I said, good on you, good on you. You know, may your tribe increase because I'm not trying to win converts to my particular church here. I would love it if everybody would be Orthodox, but more than anything, I want people to hold on to some form of small Orthodox Christianity, and I want to help them do it. Let's get a question from one of the kids from Hope. Any, please, sweet. And loud, loud, so we can hear you. So, uh, in your city, The question is, uh, with reference to Tim Keller, the very successful Presbyterian pastor in New York City, um, he's become a real, if you don't know his work, he's become a real icon um, for evangelicals for his successful work in, in big cities, which are very secular. And um, the questioner wants to know, you know, how does the Benedict Option, how can you reconcile that with Tim Keller's success? I would say that um, I don't, it's funny you ask that question about Tim Keller. I was just out in, in California at Pepperdine, um, and I was trying to talk to some PCA pres Presbyterians, that's Tim Keller's uh, Presbyterian Church, about why it is that Tim Keller followers tend to react very negatively to the Benedict Option, even though they share a lot of the, um, of the critique of the culture. And uh, I'm still not quite sure I understand it, except for they are a lot more optimistic about the prospects for conversion and for uh, revival and evangelization in this society. I've heard it said, I don't know Tim Keller, I admire the work he's done from afar, but I've heard it said that uh, by some people within his own church that he has um, compromised too much for the sake of being heard in a secular environment like New York City. Again, I don't know that this is true. I know, I've read these criticisms of him. And I think that that's something we always have to be afraid of. You know, when it's, it is true that we have to work to be heard with the people we're among, you know, and we have to be able to speak to them in their own language. But I think there's a real danger of trying so hard to be winsome that we, we shortchange the gospel and maybe even sell out our own witness for the sake of being nice. Um, I hate the word winsome, by the way. That's a big word among a lot of evangelicals. It means that thinking that if, we just, if we're just nicer and show that we're not like those angry fundamentalists, the secular world will like us more and will listen to us. I just don't think that's true anymore. I think that it's not that they, they don't dislike us and even in some cases hate us because we're not packaging our message in a friendly manner. They dislike us and even hate us because of what we believe. And uh, I don't think that gives us license to be nasty to people. I'm just, I'm not that way naturally and I would never endorse that sort of thing. But I think that, um, I, I think that the danger from the Tim Keller kind of approach is that it will concede too much to, to the secular world for the sake of spreading the gospel. And in fact, they will not be spreading a transformative gospel, but a form of moralistic therapeutic deism. Again, not accusing him of that, but I think that's a danger. <clears throat> Okay, let's open it up. Uh, sir, and again, uh, stand up and tell us your name. Yeah. Uh, my name is Tomáš Harik. I think I can uh, add something from my life experience because I spent 42 years under the oppressive communist regime in Czechoslovakia. I was secretly ordained Catholic priest in the same day when John Paul II became Pope, and even my mother was not allowed to know that I was a priest. I was 11 years in underground, and after the end of communism, I became professor 
at, uh, and uh, chaplain of the university. And I was very close to John Paul II and also with Pope Benedict. And I baptized in these 20 years, 25 years after the fall of communism, around 2,000 students uh, after two uh, years of catechumenate. So I know what it is uh, the Church of Catacomb. I spent every year five weeks in a solitude in a hermitage for meditation in all my books I have written there. But I think it's uh, something different. They are the moments in history when the church must go to the counterculture, uh, to the underground. <coughs> but I know also the shadow side of this. So I'm afraid I absolutely disagree with your Benedict option. And I think if the church will take this direction, it will be a disaster, it will destroy the Catholicity of the church, the church became a sect. Uh, I remember how after the fall of communism, uh, many Christians were not able to live without an enemy. And, uh, they, uh, and how uh, the atmosphere was poisoned by this lack of the open air, of uh, the mutual interaction with the culture. I take absolutely a different Benedict option. Was the Pope Benedict, uh, before, uh, one year before he became Pope, he uh, got this famous dialogue with Jürgen Habermas. And he said that uh, the secular humanism and Christianity need each other to overcome the danger of one-sidedness. And for Benedict, always the compatibility between the secular culture and the Christianity was very important way, the compatibility <coughs> to not be the same, uh, the dialectic, the dynamism, and I think it is also the great gift of the American church uh, to uh, the word Catholicism, that the American church uh, in, uh, uh, has the uh, different historical experience and offer this experience that is able to live in the open, democratic, free, pluralistic society and that is uh, very good milieu uh, 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 for the Catholicism. And I think this uh, American, uh, uh, American experience was influenced also the Vatican II. The Vatican II, thanks to God, uh, realized that to go through counterculture is a disaster. The counterculture is anti-Catholic. And uh, I know uh, uh, the fruits. Also here in America, when I came uh, some years ago and I turned the TV and I see the Catholic TV and I see the Mother Angelica, I, th I, I was sure it is a satirical comedy. And uh, I think it's, it's, uh, uh, no, it's not uh, some, uh, somebody is playing the nun with this enterprising, this terrible people of Saint Anthony. Why the church don't protest against this? This is blasphemy. Okay, let, let's get let's get a re let's get a response. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, let's let's get a let's get a response. Okay. Well, uh, the uh, the the commenter is a, a priest, right? A priest um, who was secretly ordained in, under communism in Czechoslovakia and uh, lived in the underground church, he has a, says he has a strong objection to the Benedict option because he believes it's separatism and that it will be a disaster for the church um, if we go this route. And he says that it's much better to live in the open, uh, in dialogue with the secular world. Um, is that a fair characterization of what you said? Yeah, and he thinks the American church is a good example, right? Well, I, I would say to that, um, uh, it, it's interesting you bring up the, the, the Czech example because in my book, I draw on Václav Benda and the, the, the example of, the, of Václav Havel and the, the resistors 
the dissenters under communism and uh, building a parallel polis, which is to say uh, 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 if they were not allowed to participate in fully in Czech society under communism, then they said that it's not enough to go into the, you can't just withdraw and hide in your own house, which, uh, which Václav Benda said a lot of Catholics were doing then because they were so oppressed by the government. You have to stay involved in some way. If you are not allowed to participate in political life, then, then do things like uh, create uh, institutions, informal institutions of civil society, like underground classes to teach real literature, things like that. Um, I don't believe that we are facing anything like you know, what, what they had to face. Nevertheless, I think that's a, there's, there is hope there in that example in that if we feel, if we're pushed further and further to the margins of public life, as is happening, um, especially in Europe, um, we, that's no, no excuse just to, to sit at home, but it just means we have to be creative minorities. It's still political when you do something that involves other people locally. Um, now, I, I would say that I, I think that you, if we're going to interact with the secular world, we have to bring something to that, to that conversation. Um, and if we, so many of us American Christians, not only Catholics, but Christians, as I said in the talk, we don't even know our own history. We don't, the secular world is so powerful now, and they know what they believe and why they believe it. Um, I think that we're going to get bowled over and assimilated if we don't bring real knowledge from theological knowledge and knowledge of church history and tradition to this conversation. Um, because I believe, I, I don't think the American church is actually a good example at all when you look at what uh, Christian Smith has discovered about uh, how little American Catholics and other Christians know about our own, our own faith and how, if you look at the numbers of how we're falling away, it, it, the, the membership in the church is collapsing. There's got to be a reason why. I don't know that the Benedict option is the answer, but I know we cannot continue business as usual because it's not working. Okay, let's try to get a couple short I questions. No, 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 yes, sir. Uh, you keep talking about uh, you know, the, the people going away from the church. You said 45, 34,000 in England stopped going to church. That doesn't mean there's 35,000 lost souls. They just don't want to go to church and pay the money. But they still believe. How do you know this? They still believe. How do you know? And, uh, and your, your uh, Benedict option is against France. Pope Francis' engagement. Why do you say that? It's against, you're against Pope, you're coming to Notre Dame and you're saying that Pope Francis should not engage. Why are you, that is wrong. You're, you're, com you no, you're completely wrong. I mean, you, if you're gonna criticize me, criticize what I actually said, not what you think I said. Somebody else, please. Let's get a question, let's get another student question. Way in the back. I'm trying to guide here. I'm trying to speak to all economics. So, in regrouping and rebuilding Christian communities, how do we deal with the fact that the capitalist, materialist, economic order, which alienates us so much from each other and from our faith, touches every part of our lives and consumes all of our institutions? How do we overcome that? Yeah, it's yeah, I think so. I mean, I hope I got the question right. You said you're, the questioner is doing her thesis on the Hyattsville Catholic community, which I write about in the book around the, uh, uh, around the parish there and the school there. And she wants to know what about economics? Since economics touches every aspect of life, how do we approach that as Christians in, in the Benedict option? I, you know, I, I am not, I don't think economically. I think more in terms of morality and culture, but I think this is an absolutely fruitful and necessary area to talk about because um, our, the, one of the reasons that our communities have fragmented so much, this, this is late capitalism, you know, and we can't, I think there's a tendency of some of us to blame, blame others for, for, for this, this fragmentation, but it's also the case that I very much like to have choice. Back in the 70s, when I was a kid, we didn't have the kind of choices we did. We had crummy cars, and you just made do with them. So I like having this choice, but there's a cost for that, and the cost is to community. Um, I, I'd, be, I'd be lying to you if I tried to pontificate about what I thought the economic, um, 
the economic solution is here. But I, I do think, and I, I've told this, there's a guy, Caleb Bernacchio, who is, uh, he's, we, you know, he and I talked about this, but he, he's a real critic of the Benedict Option because he says it doesn't pay enough attention to economics. And I say, you know what, you're right about that. This book does not pay enough attention to economics, but that's not where my gifts are. I want this book to be an inspiration to people who do understand economics and who do understand these other areas of specialty to bring what you know to it and let's, let's hammer out these um, um, models within community um, because I, economics are really, you're absolutely right, they're vital. I just wish I knew more about it myself. Maybe you're the one who can, who can add something here. Okay, the economics has the whole third floor. Maybe they can make themselves useful. <laughs> yeah. I'm Paul, I'm a first year law student here, and um, I am an Orthodox Christian, paid Orthodox, like you, I'm a Greek ancestry. Um, I don't think there's any interest in Greek saying that you would be wrong. I'm a little myth that you didn't call it the Basin of Greek or the John Chrysostom. <laughs> Benedict is an Orthodox saint. Yeah, and part of what gets me also to talk about the fall of the Roman Empire, I'm like, you know, the bad Roman Empire fell. Constantinople was fine for another thousand years. Did you notice I said the last one? Yes, it's true. But, <laughs> I'm personally living in the diaspora, I'm not eating Greece, and I'm only partially Greek by ancestry. But sometimes I feel that Orthodox has the role of a new Byzantium on the world stage because, at least until recently, especially being from the Chicago area, the Greek immigrant community, the American culture wars stopped at the church door. And Greek culture has no problems. But uh, you see there as being an equivalent, you see we're in an equivalent to a falling Western Roman Empire. Where is the Eastern Roman Empire? Oh, that's a good question. That uh, our questioner is uh, Greek Orthodox, and he wants to know um, if the Roman Empire is falling in the West, the contemporary Roman Empire is falling in the West, well, where is the Eastern Roman Empire today? Because you, you may or may not know that uh, when Rome fell in the West, it continued on for over a thousand more years in Constantinople. Um, and I, I think if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying what role does Orthodoxy have to play in this? Um, I have tried very hard not to get involved in Russian politics because you're, you're talking about the role of the state in the, in the rebirth of the Russian Orthodox Church. I know that uh, a number of Catholic friends of mine look to what's happening in Russia um, and approve of it. And I say, well, you know, I'm glad the church is being reborn in Russia, but we have to keep in mind too that it's so tied into the state and that can be really unhealthy for the church. But I, I, I live in the West. I'm a man of the West. I'm an, I'm an Orthodox Christian. I worship here. But I, I believe that the, if we're waiting for the West to become Orthodox, I don't think it's going to happen. But I'm so encouraged by the, the rapprochement that's happening between the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox churches. Um, it started uh, under John Paul, really picked up under Benedict, and is continuing under Francis. Uh, because I, I agree with Pope John Paul, the church needs both lungs to breathe. I, don't, I doubt very much you and I are ever going to live to see them, the churches reunited. I hope we do. I, it may not happen until Christ returns, but that doesn't mean that we can't help each other. I, I think that uh, the church in the West could use much more of the liturgical discipline and the, the mystical spirituality of the East. And people in the East, uh, Orthodox Christians, could use much more of the Catholicity of the West, of, of a sense of the, we, we are, we're not just a parochial tribe at prayer, but you know, we, we are Christians you, you know, who share something more universal. But um, I, I was just in Paris for the, the French publication of the Benedict Option, went to liturgy at uh, the new Russian cathedral there, and was really surprised and pleased to see young Catholics who don't intend to become Orthodox, but they're interested in Orthodoxy because they want to know what they have been denied by, the, by, by history um, uh, from, from the, the Orthodox faith. What of Eastern Christianity that they can take into their own lives now and accept as part of their own history too. I think that's really encouraging. And I hope that in Russia, I don't know, but I hope that in Russia and Greece, there's more of an openness to more traditional-minded Catholics in the West 
because um, there's a lot that we have in common and that we can share together. And I saw it happening in Paris, and it made me really excited. Okay, let's get two more questions. We'll, let, let, we'll make them uh, uh, short. Thank you very much, Amir. Thank you for the talk. Um, I guess my question boils down to, I guess, the dynamics of the ecumenical nature uh -huh. of the project, um, as you put it. Because when we talk about small Orthodox Christians, um, I do wonder when you say like how you think about culture and how you know, someone like Durkheim can show that beliefs <coughs> among, I mean, I'm not going to talk about Orthodox now, but Catholic Protestant especially, a certain beliefs do inform cultural action. So suicide rates, Durkheim says, right? are religiously biased, at least at this time, between Catholics and Protestants. Catholics beliefs on damnation and salvation lower the suicide rate, he seems to say. Things like that, um, you know, birth control, etc. And if, and if the call of the Benedict Option is to take one's Christian tradition, whether it be a form of, you know, non-modernist Lutheranism or Roman Catholicism, etc., but we still have these kind of cultural distinctions, I am wondering what, if you could give us specific concrete examples um, of cultural practices informed by this ecumenical, small, orthodox <coughs> Christian belief system that would mark us different from the modern world. Okay. Um, the idea is about, the question is about ecumenism, this quote-unquote small, little, orthodox Christianity that I'm talking about. And... Um, how are there any examples of this spirituality or this sort of this ecumenism that we can point to in the modern world? Is that is that fair? Yeah, like something that's reducible, like a cultural action that's reducible across all. Yeah. A cultural action that is reducible across all Orthodox, smaller Orthodox Christianity. The the thing that comes to mind straight away are classical Christian schools that are happy. I don't know how many of you know about the model, but. It's, um, it's a form of education that follows the trivium, um, and it's becoming more and more popular among Catholics and evangelicals and Reformed Protestants and so forth. Um, in some places, like in Hyattsville, it is done in a fully Catholic, uh, they have a school that is 100% Catholic, follows a classical model. That's how it is in uh, San Benedetto del Tronto, too, in Italy, the Tipoloski. Um, there are others that are uh, fully Protestant within the Reformed tradition. But then there are schools like the one my kids go to and my wife teaches in in Baton Rouge, which is, um, is ecumenical in the sense that it's, it's mostly Protestant, but there are also Catholic families there and our family, which is Orthodox. We're really fortunate in that the, the headmaster has a real generous orthodoxy about him. He wants to make Catholics and Orthodox feel welcome in that school, even though its ethos is pr predominantly Protestant. And, uh, and he, it succeeded. And I think what's happening now is a lot of the, the people there in the school, the parents, are starting to realize that, you know what, those Catholics are, and those Orthodox are not what we thought they were. And we, in turn, we Catholics and Orthodox are realizing, you know what, those Evangelicals are not what we thought they were. And we realize we have so much more in common now because we all agree, even though we, we, we differ precisely on church authority, we all believe in a traditional expression of the faith against the, more, the modernist, even within our own tradition. And it's, it's not so much running away from the modernist in our own tradition as running toward each other and looking for, uh, for solidarity, practical solidarity, what Timothy George, the uh, Southern Baptist theologian, called an ecumenism of the trenches. This is uh, the, the, the cooperation that Catholics and evangelicals found outside abortion clinics. You know, they realized that, you know what, we, we're actually closer, more brothers and sisters in Christ than we might have thought because we're going to stand here and witness against the evil of abortion. And uh, I think in general, that is, uh, that is we don't need to, to get our hopes up too high because I'm not asking Southern Baptists to convert and I'm not planning to convert either. But when we can work together to support each other, we should. I found much more excitement uh, for the Benedict option among evangelicals than among Catholics, even though St. Benedict is recognized as a saint by the Catholics and the Orthodox. And that's okay. You know, I, the evangelicals I know who are interested in this want to know more about church history. They want to know more about liturgy. And, uh, and again, I've learned a lot from them too. So it's a practical ecumenism, not one that, that ultimately sees un, re, reunion of the churches, but in, in projects like schools, 
and forming the next generation and, and forming that solidarity, those networks of solidarity uh, across denominational lines to help each other in practical ways. Okay, let's get one final question here. Sure. Despite the Center for Ethics and Culture gear, go ahead. Uh, my name is Dominic. I'm a first year law theology grad student. I was wondering if you would comment on what you see as the role of a place like Notre Dame going forward, which at the University of, in some respects, trains its students to enter those sectors of society mm -hmm. that are sort of inimical to uh, Christian belief, and in some respects, is a very fertile ground for these sort of conversations, fostering these sorts of communities yeah. as you want. So, what sort of spiritual medicine? It's a great, what a great question to end on. The question is, what is the role of a place like Notre Dame, which trains its students to go into the world, into these, these hostile professions, um, uh, but also, I didn't catch the very last bit about... And, and on the other hand, it's also a fertile place for the sorts of conversation or for manifesting the sorts of local, you know, Benedict Option type yeah. communities. Yeah. And it's also a place that fosters conversations for maybe building local Benedict Option communities. Um, <clears throat> I believe that Christians will continue to go out into the world, into law, into medicine, into the professions, and so on and so forth. And I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that, but I also believe that if we are going to do that, we have to go as fully formed, deeply formed Christians. So a place like Notre Dame, uh, by giving uh, not only spiritual formation, but a deep intellectual formation in the Catholic tradition, um, can prepare its students to be real witnesses in these professions. It's also the case that they, if they have real spiritual formation, they will have the courage, I think, to walk away from those professions when they are asked to do things that they can't do. I, uh, in my book, I have a, a quote from a doctor, a very prominent Catholic physician in the country, who, whose name I wouldn't use, who told me that he would not want his children to go into medicine. I'm like, really, why is that? He said, because I can see what's happening now. He's at a very senior level in the medical establishment. He said, we can already see movements within the profession to refuse to license um, uh, physicians if they won't perform abortions or, um, uh, or do euthanasia and, and other things that could violate their conscience. He said, my generation, we've been able to fight that off for a while. But he said, I can see it happening now with the younger generation of people, of, of, of doctors, who have no experience of faith at all, don't know why religious liberty is important and feel that they are doing the right thing by compelling doctors to do these things. He said, uh, so, so why wouldn't you want your kids to go into it and fight that? He said, because they'll have to acquire like $400,000 worth of debt for medical school, and I don't want them to be in the position of being told, oh, if you want to pay this debt off, you have got to agree to do abortions or euthanasia. Um, so, you know, whether that's realistic, I, I trust this guy because of who he is and the authority with which he speaks, but um, he, because he is a Catholic first and foremost, a lifelong physician, but a Catholic, he knows that this, he can see the dangers coming and wants to steer his kids to some other way to serve God in a profession. I think a place like Notre Dame, especially in the law school, by giving young people here an understanding of what's happening in the world and what is likely to happen and how to prepare for it, I think they can do a tremendous service. It's also the case, too, that by fostering these uh, small communities of, of faith and fellowship that are brought together purposefully, that um, you can learn how to be in community together. And that will be something that can, you can take into the world. I'll end on this. At the University of Virginia, I write about this in the book, around the Christian Studies Center. It's a, uh, an evangelical thing, but they have a, a group of houses, privately owned ho residences for students, males and females. And um, the people there, the kids who live there, have loved so much living in community together that some of them have stayed behind in Charlottesville after they graduated because they've gotten so involved in their local church and community that they want to stay. It's more important to them to have that community than to go to Washington or New York and pursue their career. Or if they have moved to Washington, they form group houses there and they want to continue the experience of life in Christian community because it gave them something that they never had growing up. And I think that's a wonderful thing. And to the extent that Notre Dame having this concentration of intelligent, idealistic, I hope, young Catholic students and even non-Catholic Christian students can, 
can give, them, give you that experience too and inspire you to go out into the world and be a witness by the lives we lead. Pope Benedict XVI said that the, great witness, the greatest uh, witnesses, the greatest arguments the church has for itself are not so much the arguments, but the art it produces and the saints. In other words, beauty, the beautiful cultural forms that come out of Christian faith, and holiness embodied in service and, and sacrifice. These are the sort of things that I think are going to convert hearts in the future. And uh, so learn, start learning how to do it right here, right now, and, and then go out there and make converts of the world. Thank you.